Are we green? All right. So Heim came in, and I, I, this was my first hypnotherapy certification, oddly enough called Renegade Hypnosis. Uh, most of the hypnosis work I do is based on neuroscience, not folklore. So like I said, when, my, when I say you don't have to believe in the stuff I'm going to teach you, you just got to follow the instructions, I mean what I say. But Heim came in, I didn't know who he was. And uh, first day and a half, I basically just throw people into doing inductions. Not slow, long, progressive relaxation inductions, but walk up and sleep inductions. Right? The most challenging, most terrifying aspect of hypnosis, hypnosis when they're being trained is, is the concept of instant and rapid inductions. So we get you doing that right off the bat. When you find out hypnosis actually is ridiculously easy. Okay? Because human beings are trans machines. We can't function. We can't do 99% of the things we do without some modulation in our perceptual filters. Hypnosis is the most natural thing on the planet. It's just any process that leads to a shift in consciousness. Right? The, diff the primary difference between things like self-hypnosis, hypnosis, and meditation is that when you're doing meditations, more often than not, you're in a receptive state. You're trying to receive something from a transpersonal source. Oh. Is it hypnosis uh, involved with the subconscious, not the conscious? Absolutely. But everything you do involves your subconscious. It's like that joke by Emu Phillips. You remember him? He was a comedian or a commodian back in the early 80s. He, would, he was very intellectual, very geeky kind of, but he has this one line, and it really sums up the whole conscious, unconscious dynamic. He goes, you know, I used to think the brain is the most fascinating organ in the body. And then I realized, look who's telling me that. <laughs> that dynamic, if you just replace brain with conscious mind versus unconscious mind, you'd have pretty much the dynamic the average human being lives in. You see, your conscious mind, as loud as it shouts, and as much as it likes to think it's in control, and it knows what's going on, and it knows where all the problems are, your conscious mind is actually the least informed and the last to know anything. Period. End of story. Okay. As a hypnotherapist, as an energy healer, as a neuro-linguistic programmer, I'll give you my pedigree in a few minutes after we get a few more bodies in here. Uh, the first thing you learn if you're going to do this work professionally is that everyone who comes into your room for treatment of any kind, physical, mental, emotional, acute or chronic. The minute they tell you where the problem started, they're lying to you. Because if they consciously knew where the problem started, they wouldn't be sitting in the chair. And so when you peel back the layers of the, of the conscious mind, and you talk to the boss, as I like to put it, the, conscious, the unconscious mind, there's only two entities really that know where those problems started. That's God and your unconscious mind. Now sometimes God takes my calls, sometimes not. But the unconscious mind is always home, and he always answers, or she always answers. So when you talk to the boss, yes? But don't you have to get into that meditative state to talk to your higher mind? Define meditative state. Like you have to get it to a, sta a focused state so that you can receive messages. I'm talking about receiving now, mm -hmm. so that's probably not. Uh, you know, from your higher mind, or the universe. Absolutely, absolutely. The problem that we have when we start talking about things like meditation and hypnosis, which is a loaded word, by the way, or NLP, is we're actually, in essence, talking about something else, something that we don't even think about. Or we, we just, it's there, it's kind of like, hidden in plain sight. All of these things have one thing, or Qigong, or energy work, right? Qigong, energy work, learning. Creating. All of these things have one thing in common. The one thing that unifies all of them. Trance. What is trance? It's a shift. 
in the perceptual filters you have in place. In other words, consciousness. What are you paying attention to? What are you not paying attention to? What information is available to you and what information isn't? Okay? Tonight's workshop is about, is titled Secrets of Personal Transformation. Now, it can be any kind of transformation you want, whether it's uh, you want to work the law of attraction, manifestation. You want to attract the right kind of gal or guy into your life. You want to learn more about becoming more spiritual, more evolved. All of those transformations are on the table because they're all mediated by the same set of processes. Does that make sense? Right? It's trance. Your ability to shift your consciousness, your set of perceptual filters, the kinds of information and the breadth of information that you have access to. That's what a trance state is. Trance states in general, hey, come on in, Lynn. Trance states in general have only two components. Only two. When you have these two components, the proportions of them give what hypnotists classically call depth of trance. This must be one of those vision pulse markers. Because they're always dried out and they never work. Okay. Depth of trance. Depth of trance really has two things. It has absorption in the experience combined with a continually narrowing focus of attention. To the degree that you have it, you have trance. Okay? Now, how does this all work in terms of our day-to-day -day experience? Let's go back to neuroscience. Anybody here know, ever heard of a guy named Paul Ekman? Raise your hands if you have. If you haven't, you should really study his stuff. Ekman's actually done a tremendous amount of, man, it's loud today. <laughs> They're all coming to get me. He's giving away universal secrets. Let's bomb him, right? By the way, if politically correct, in, in, uh, incorrect language bothers you or offends you, leave now. Uh, if straight talk offends you, leave now, okay? I'm a no BS kind of guy. I like to have fun with what I do, even if I'm approaching very serious topics. When you hear me talk about things like terminal cancer or multiple sclerosis, okay, they're heavy topics, but you'll never, you'll never actually beat them by being too serious. Seriously. Okay. Learn to be playful with what you do, and you'll have a tremendous amount of power over your life. The problem is we, most of us take ourselves way too friggin' seriously for our own good. The more serious you get, the more resources you shut off. Okay? So we're talking about depth of trance, we're talking about absorption and focus in the experience. Where was I going with this? Anybody remember? I open loop myself. I do that a lot, you'll find, which is why the questions sometimes frustrate people when they watch my YouTube videos. Oh, yes, thank you. Paul Ekman. <laughs> Paul Ekman wrote many books, as a matter of fact, but if you've ever heard of a show called Lie to Me, how many of you have heard of that show? Raise your hands. Cool. Uh, if you haven't, go rent every season. Even though anything with Tim Roth in it eventually gets very sick and twisted, um, the information and the, he, Ekman was the actual consultant for that show. It's about a guy who uses facial expressions and micro expressions and body language cues to determine lies. But a lot of people don't realize that Ekman was one of the world's leading researchers on emotion. And in his book, emotions revealed, he talks about a concept called the emotional refractory period. The emotional refractory period is this behavior that your nervous system does without your permission and without your consent. Now, when I say the term refractory period, how many people actually know what the hell I'm talking about? Okay, I see two hands, so maybe I should, maybe I should explain that, right? Mm. Usually when I talk about a refractory period, the first thing people think about is the ejaculatory orgasmic refractory period. <laughs> Right? For those of you who don't know what that means, that means that after you have an orgasm or a climax, male or female, really doesn't matter, there's a set period of time where you can't really function again. Right? Kind of, kind of reset yourself. The emotional refractory period is a little bit different, but it has 
a time aspect to it that we need to understand. Anybody here ever been in an argument with somebody? <laughs> kind of a generic question, right? Have you ever been in an argument with somebody and you go through this knockdown, drag out, whatever it was, and you resolve the argument, and then for the next 10, 15, 20 minutes, however long it is, anything you say to them pisses them off again. Everybody's going, some are going. Welcome to the wonderful world of the emotional refractory period. You see, the mechanics behind the emotional refractory period is that whenever you have a shift in your emotional state or consciousness, that emotional state is like a little life form that lives inside of you. Now, this isn't metaphysics. This isn't law of attraction mumbo jumbo. This is neuroscience. What happens, literally, is that the, the brain, the nervous system, seeks to maintain a sense of equilibrium. From whatever state it's in, it doesn't want to change it. So what it will do for a set amount of time is it will change what you consciously pay attention to in your environment, both in terms of the words people say, the possible connotations of it, and it will bring the aspects of the communication of the environment or the context that you're in and twist it in such a way that it reinforces or re-triggers the state you're already in. Now, as little kids, we already know this, partly, because we come home and we want, we want to do something at school or we want to do something with our friends. The first words out of our mouth is, is mom in a good mood? Because we know if she's in a good mood, she's more likely to look upon our request benevolently, right? But this is how your mind works. You see, the conscious mind, the part of you that thinks, that rationalizes, has no concept of what reality really is. All it gets is a distilled, spun, distorted view based on the perceptual filters percolating below the threshold of conscious awareness. How many people are very spiritual? Raise your hands if you think you're spiritual or you believe you're spiritual. Cool. That's all right. I'm spiritual, right? How many people here want to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? How many people think they're rational? Boy, are you in for a shock. <laughs> but the bottom line, is it hot in here? Cause we, yeah. Can we get somebody to kind of crank the, the AC a little bit? James, can you get Tracy to, to tell Florente to, thank you. Um, anybody here ever go shopping for a car? Right? Some of us more so than others, right? Now, did you ever notice, now some of you may have noticed this, some not so much. Did you ever notice that when you go and you look at a car and you decide what you want, you know, you've done the research, you've picked out the color, you've gone from dealership to dealership looking for the best deal on that car and that color, and you finally get around to buying the car, right? And you're driving it home and you're happy as a clam. And every mofo on the planet bought the same car on the same day. What's up with that? Perceptual filters. How many people here believe in the law of attraction? Okay. Law of attraction states that you will pull things into your world, into your reality, that are in harmony with the vibration you put out there. In other words, the dominant thoughts you hold attract things into your life. Here's the rub, ladies and gentlemen. Your dominant thoughts are not what you think they are. Your dominant thoughts are the unconscious beliefs, emotional surges, percolating below the threshold of your conscious mind. They're not the things you can volitionally pay attention to. So when you seek to do the law of attraction or utilize the law of attraction, you gotta clean out the crap that's percolating below the conscious, the firewall of the conscious mind. Because if you don't, it's gonna, it's gonna taint, it's gonna color, it's gonna twist what you think you're getting in ways you can't possibly begin to imagine. So when we talk about transformation, we talk about law of attraction, we talk about getting further in our lives or healing our bodies, we're talking about a lot of the same mechanisms, okay? Which is the subject of tonight's workshop, or play shop, as the case may be, because I like to have fun, right? Uh, I guess we're gonna go ahead and get started, because I'm 10 minutes into this, right? My name is David Snyder. I want to welcome you all to NLP Power slash all things San Diego. However you came here, it's because you were meant to be. Tonight we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to learn a lot of cool stuff. My job today 
is to teach you how to, a little bit about how to run your own brain, how to run your own body, because they are not, in fact, separate entities. I'm going to introduce you to some concepts today that bridge both hypnosis, meditation, energy healing, neuroscience, social psychology. We're going to put it all together and present to you a model that you can begin to work with. Okay? Now, if the scope of what I want to talk to you about and share with you is this, we probably only have time for this. So my goal here is to take you as far as I can in the time that we have. And then, for those of you who want to go further, I'll show you where to go to get more. For my edification, just so I know kind of uh, how to spin what's going on tonight. How many people here are coaches, clients, energy healers? Raise your hands, just so I can see. <coughs> By show of hands. Okay, great. How many people here have aspirations to be? All right. How many people here just want to fix their own crap? <laughs> then you're in the right place, okay? Crap being a technical term, which I haven't come up with a cool acronym yet. Unlike SHIT, S-H-I-T, Secret Hidden Influence Technologies. All right, let's talk about how your mind really works, okay? Um, find my, my eraser. First thing we need to talk about is identity. In other words, when we're talking about the law of attraction, we're talking about manifesting or getting over illness, we need to talk about who we are as a person. And not just who we are as a person in terms of how the world sees us, but how we see us. Okay? Anybody here ever tried to get something done that just ran into one kind of resistance after another? How many people here keep attracting the same shit into their lives over and over again? Right? You ladies, the, the guy's face changes, but the attitudes and behaviors stay the same. Right? You get so far, and all of a sudden the same thing happens, it's just different players. Right? How does that happen? It's because patterns repeat at the unconscious level. Okay? John Asaraf, who's featured in The Secret, says, you cannot out-earn or outperform anything that is in conflict with your own self-image, okay? Simple, if you don't think you deserve it, if it's not in conflict, if it's in conflict with who you, how you see, you, who you see as yourself, yourself as, how you talk to yourself, how the voices in your head talk to you. How many people have a voice in their head that says nasty shit to them? How many have more than one? How many are lying? All of you have them. I promise you. Okay. Self-image is your ego, right? Not necessarily. No. Ego is a part of who you are. I'm not going to get all Freudian <laughs> on you, because um, he was a messed up dude, you know. In NLP circles, in NLP circles, we call him sick man fraud. But uh, you know, he was a psychotherapist, right? Uh, Got to watch that because he'll come back to haunt me. But hypnotherapists are no different. Hypno the rapist. Most of the people who make that joke are hypnotherapists, right? And then they don't realize that the same exact thing can be said about their profession. So I'm an equal opportunity hater. Get over that. The interesting thing about the human condition, about our brains, is among all God's creatures, except for maybe the dolphins and the whales, not sure about them, we are the only ones with the capacity for reflective thought. We have the ability to have thoughts about our thoughts to have feelings about our feelings. And it's that beautiful aspect of us that more often than not screws us up. Okay? Because we can, in fact, have multiple uh, thoughts about our thoughts that are in conflict with each other. And that's usually why most people wind up in my chair. Because either the, the identities or the self-reflections that they have are in conflict, or one level of programming or learning that they've received is in conflict with another. Most people here have a reptile. You guys know you have three brains, right? Okay. You have your reptilian <coughs> brain, which is the oldest part of you. You have your limbic system, or your mammalian brain. 
And then you have the newest level of your brain, which is the neocortex. This is the seat of your rational and analytical functions. It's also the part of you that thinks in language. Okay? We call it the rational lying brain. Because between these two parts of you and this one, there's this little firewall. And that firewall isn't solid, it's a set of filters. But the problem that we have is that most of the behaviors we generate, we generate for primal reasons, to satisfy a fundamental primal drive. But sometimes the desire and the, willing and the, the urge to act on them is repugnant even to our self-image. And so what happens is the reptilian brain generates an emotion that forces us to take action. You ever notice you don't ever take an, you don't ever take an action on something? What is that? They're coming to get me. Uh, you never take an action. Maybe I should change topics. What do you think? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, you ever notice? God. Okay. Well, well, we'll work with this as best we can. You ever notice you don't really actually ever act on anything until you have an emotion about it? Right? In, in neuro linguistic programming, we say all. Is there a speaker behind me or something? Yeah, right there. It's that one right there. Okay. I don't, I'll, I'll just stand over here and see what happens. Um, and all decision strategies end in a K. In other words, we have some kind of a feeling either internally or we take some kind of action externally. We're going to talk a lot about your body today because when you want to do energy, really powerful, rapid, energetic change, when you want to do really powerful emotional change, you've got to get the body involved. You can't willpower your way through things. We're not built that way. Cover your ears. Can we get Florante in here and see what we can do about the sound system? All right. I'll turn this down. No, actually. Not too often. I'm not walking in front of anything, so I'm not sure what's causing that. Is it? Oh. Well, it's for now, anyway. It's a, it's a conspiracy, right? It's a technician effect. Everything's going bad until the tech shows up, and then you look like a moron. Right? OK, let's talk about your identity real quick. When you want to manifest something, you've got to get your identity solid. You've got to remove the filters that say you can't have it. Let's play a little game, shall we? I want you all to think of something that you want to manifest in your life. Something that's just, you know, go for, reach for the stars, right? Close your eyes. Good. And now what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that there's a big picture of it floating in space somewhere out in front of you. I want you to reach out and touch that picture. Just reach out and touch it. Now take both your hands, trace the edges of it. So you, you know, frame it with your hands so you know how big it is. Now as you do that, here's what I want you to do. I want you to notice that there's a, that feeling connected to that picture is somewhere in your body. Point to where you feel it. Reach it, physically point to where you feel it. Now grab that picture with both hands and double the size of it. So it's like, yeah. Notice what happens to the feeling. Ooh. Now take it, make it half the size. Now make it half small again. What happened? Yeah, some of you are going, ew. Some of you are going, great, right? Now bring it back to its normal size. Now make it as big and as juicy as you want it to be, and leave it that size for now. OK. Now open your eyes, look up here. I'm going to ask you a weird question. As you were thinking about that thing you want, thing you were all excited about, how many of you noticed in the background there was like these little icky feelings trying to poke their heads in? Right? Some of you were just overwhelmed by the size of your picture, so you didn't know, pay attention to anything else. But those little icky feelings, they're like just little, you know, little nuisances that you just want to ignore. Those are the dominant thoughts lodged in your unconscious mind. The parts of you that are in conflict with that outcome. Okay? Your dominant thoughts are largely unconscious. That's why they're dominant. Because if your heart only, would only beat when you paid attention to it, you wouldn't be here very long. Right? 
Your unconscious mind is monitoring every aspect of your life. It does run your life, ladies and gentlemen. Get over it. Truly, get over it. Our job as rational beings, hate that word, by the way, is to become progressively more self-aware, to progressively open up the communication between all levels of our mind so that information flows freely and clearly. Right? Your, your conscious mind is always the least informed and the last to know. Right? Um, so one of the things that we want to start to do, the first thing we got to do, really, is we have to clean up our shit. That, word, that, that term is starting to become very popular now through our YouTube channels and everything. Every now and then I get an email that says, you're right, we got to clean up our shit. Shit being a technical term, by the way. Okay, we got to remove the blocks. We got to remove the limitations. We got to start to really go, we got to run into a burning building that everybody else wants to run out of. Because that's what your reptile brain wants you to do. The reptile brain runs towards pleasure and away from pain. And if you want to stay an animal, keep doing that. But if you want to transcend yourself, if you want to become more of what you're potentially capable of being, then every time you have a polarity response towards or away from, you must go into it. You must explore it. Now, when it's a pleasurable experience, we don't have a problem, right? Oh, that feels good, I'm gonna go do that. We'll explore that all day long, right? The problem is when we have a less than positive experience, we just wanna forget about that and move towards the pleasure. Well, that's designed to keep you an animal, just an animal, okay? It got you here, right? It got you through millions of years of evolution, so you owe it a debt. It's, your, it's one of your best friends. But if you want to tap into your potential, if you want to really manifest, whether it's a new car, a new life, a new mate, whatever, you've got to be willing to run into the places most people instinctively run away from. But you can't do it blind. You've got to have a set of techniques. You've got to understand the terrain that you're working with. Does that make sense? By the way, this means yes, or this means yes, this means no. This means I know the answer. This means I don't. What does this mean? Oh shit, please don't call on me. <laughs> By the way, if you have to, I sometimes talk way too much. Sometimes. sometimes. Uh, if, you need, if, if, if you need to go to the restroom before I have the presence of mind to give a break, just go. Uh, if you're hungry or thirsty, we have tons of coffee and chocolate in the back. Eat all you want. Tonight it's okay. Because tonight is about change. And one of the fastest ways to change your neurology is through a, med a neurotransmitter called oxytocin. How many of you here know what oxytocin is? Raise your hands. If not, it's also known as the cuddle hormone. Okay? The more cuddle hormone you have, the faster your nervous system rewires itself. Two primary sources that you can get a lot, well, three primary sources that you can get lots of oxytocin. Big, long hugs. Lots of chocolate. <laughs> and orgasms. Now, tonight's class is not about orgasms. Sorry, guys. It's all in the chocolate. But there's tremendous, tremendous potential in the ability to feel absolutely ecstatic on demand for long periods of time. The, lo the more oxytocin you put into the system, the more plastic your nervous system becomes. The more rapidly old, ingrained thought patterns become changed, become malleable, they change. The metaphor I like to use, anybody here, anybody here know what chicken wire is? It's that, you know, it's very malleable, it's, it's easy to flex, you know what chicken wire is, right? Think of the nerves that run through your brain and around your brain, like this chicken wire mesh lattice work, right? And it's in a certain shape. And the more oxytocin I get into that system, the more it's like I take a, a hot blowtorch and I just kind of make it nice and soft, right? And then I change the shape and then when the metal cools, the new programming sets in. That's what oxytocin does when it gets into your system. Okay? And so a lot of, the, a lot of the, the protocols that I teach 
are about teaching people how to feel really freaking good and then do the programming work. Why does chocolate work? Okay. Because it's, it has more uh, natural oxytocin in it than any other substance that I can think of. So I just ply you with lots of chocolate and sugar and candy and get you all excited. And <laughs> I am devious in my ways. You have three brains. Everything that, about your life is designed to satisfy primal drives. The problem is that when those primal drives activate, many times the way we want to express them is in conflict with our socialization or our self-image. Okay? And so what happens is the, unconscious, the, the reptile brain generates an emotion that causes us to take an action. But the conscious mind has to come up with a rationalization, a reason for doing it that is acceptable to self and society. Anytime you meet resistance in, in any kind of change work, it's because you've encountered a conflict with one of three areas in your life. You ready for this? This is the root of all resistance you'll ever face, personal or in other people. We instinctively resist anything that is in conflict with how we see ourselves. Part two, we instinctively resist any message we receive that is in conflict with how we think other people will see us. Three, we instinctively resist whatever conflicts with what we know and believe to be true. The example I like to give is if I'm a, two, uh, a five year old kid and from the time I was three to the time I was five, mommy taught me that this was a square. And then I go to kindergarten, and the teacher says, David, show me a square. And I go, here, teacher. He goes, no, David, that's not a square. This is a square. I go, no, my mommy told me that was a triangle. <laughs> I'm, it, it sounds really basic, right? But whatever gets in first is what becomes the standard by which all things after it are measured by. Your unconscious mind does not sort for right and wrong. It does not sort for true and false. It sorts for what is familiar. It doesn't sort for good and bad. One of the things about the work that I do a lot of times is people come to me for all kinds of things. Everything from how to do a backflip better to how to be more confident when they're speaking to a group. I get a disproportionate amount of, of ladies who come in so please avoid getting wigged out with what I'm about to tell you. I cannot tell you how many times people come in to me to do something better and wind up reliving a traumatic past experience that has nothing to do with the, that, the reason they came. Because it's driving your behaviors. Okay? The further back in time you go, the more powerful the memories become. And they become like the, the filter through which we sort our reality. When you have somebody who is brought into this world and they have two parents who love them deeply and they're held and they're caressed and they're told that they're loved, over time, because that was there first because the word love was connected to those feelings, that's what we'll sort for. Not because love is good okay, or pleasurable, but because it was there first. If you're brought into a, into a home or an environment where the caregivers around you, the people you view as an authority, remember, when we come into this world, we're one big freaking hard drive. We do not have a sense of self. That develops later. And it makes perfect sense when you think about it. How does a baby get, bo get formed? It forms as a set of cells in a body. There's no separation there. And so as, until, until about the age of five to 10 is when our conscious mind has enough information to actually develop and become active. Up until then, we are who, we, who the people in envir our environment are. There is no difference. We identify with the people in the environment. They become imprinted on us. Now, those imprints don't go away. You can change them, don't get me wrong. I mean, otherwise, we wouldn't be here, right? 
but they become layered with new experiences. But beneath it all are those imprints, those identities that, we've, that actually came from outside of us and were overlaid onto our consciousness. Yes? What about some of the tests they've done with genetic instincts? Mm -hmm. What about them? Well, if we're all just black hard drive, then where's the instincts come Well, we have genetic memory. We have, I, I, can, I can tell you firsthand we have genetic memory. But the identity that we have, the genetic memory just gives us a predisposition unless we do something to activate it, which is a whole other can of fish. But that's a good question. I, had a tra I actually had a transplant patient. Uh, she was a type 1 diabetic and a uh, big health nut, sweet lady. And uh, she started to have organ failure. And she had been coming to me for some, some emotional issues, and she had uh, finally gotten on the list for a transplant. And she went and had surgery. And I guess it was for a spleen and a pan and a I think a kidney. And a couple weeks after she got out of the hospital, her behavior started to change. She started eating hot dogs, craving beer and pizza, real junk food. I mean, this woman was, a, you know, when you're type 1 diabetic, you don't have a lot of leeway in terms of what you eat. And so she came in to see me, and, she, and we did a regression. And it turns out the person she got the organs from was a real garbage gut. And the memory from the organs were actually inter interacting with her system, and she was getting these cravings and these behaviors that she couldn't explain or understand. Weird, right? But again, so when you start talking about genetic memory, past lives, all those things, when you're a hypnotist, you see it all, <laughs> okay? And you see it in ways that you start to have a real open mind on certain things, but not so, not so open that your brains drop out, right? Getting back to identity. Your unconscious mind sorts for what's familiar. If you're brought into a world where the dominant authority figures in your life say, you know, they do things like bang, right? and maybe you're just in the room next to, he's talking, you're talking to a spouse or whatever, and the words you hear around you are, I'm a drunk, he's a, you know, you're a drunk, our kids are gonna be drunks. Now you're over here playing with your blocks, right? But there's no filter. And we model what we see. If we get things like, Psh, I did that because I love you. Well, guess what? That's what's familiar. It's not about good or bad. Because we don't have a concept of good or bad, right or wrong, in spite of what we consciously learn later. How many people know people that constantly date the same kind of person? <laughs> right? Who's always bad for them. And every time they hook up with someone who's a, a catch, they find some way to screw it up. Bingo. When we come in from the time we're conceived up through about five years of age, the information that we're exposed to, most of it is a first experience. It becomes the standard by which everything else is measured, familiar, not familiar. Not good, bad. Familiar, not familiar. It's only later, as time goes on, that we develop those other distinctions. Yes, sir? Um, two questions, question and a comment. Just to support what you just said, I've met people that, like let's say you're talking about females that go out with, maybe have better experience with alcoholics, but they go out with guys for years or abusers, whatever, and the guy was the most, and he, I'd meet him, but later on they were that abuser. In mm -hmm. other words, the, 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 the this, the uh, ability of the mind to figure this out mm -hmm. when you don't even know it and you're really trying to avoid it is mm -hmm. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, two years ago, Brian, if I, if I was an alcoholic, he just covered it up. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. We, we mo a lot of us, you know, tend to become more of who we are as we get older. <laughs> it's kind of a weird, weird saying. But thought patterns, that chicken wire in our brains, the more we practice certain thoughts, just like building muscle in a gym, the more developed those neurological connections become. That's why the oxytocin process is so important. Because if we can go in and start to dissolve it, to make the system more plastic, more malleable, then we can change our neurology. We can change how we think. Okay? How many people here have had a session with me or have worked with me per, for an issue? Raise your hands, just so I know. Would you be willing to stand up and share kind of some of the things about how the, these experiences affected you? Or, yeah. or please, uh, go ahead, I'll, I'll give you the. 
Here, give me a kiss, big boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just talk into the mics or whatever. Just, what's your name, John? Yes. Oh, he brought candy. Yeah. Um, so, like, for me specifically, um, I was putting myself into the uh, Asperger mild autism, um, social anxiety um, category. And I'm not sure what, what I'm going to say now. Well, just tell them, <laughs> tell them about some of the things that we changed, like, in, in just a couple minutes. Right. So, um, things that uh, being comfortable around people. Um, I, I, this is one of the th things I, I haven't been able to put into words effectively. Um, but within moments, just kind of being led to um, I don't want to say, experience um, and just make changes. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, uh, like in the subconscious, what, I, what I've just rearranging the way I perceive the world in like a, just like you would rearrange um, your, the stuff in your bedroom or the stuff in the warehouse. Um, that just, and then allowed me to just live a different life and not trip over certain things and not fall into certain pitfalls that I had just habitually fell into. Is he speaking really fluently? For a guy with social anxiety? Give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Below the threshold of your conscious awareness are sets of filters. Those filters do one of three things. They delete, they distort, and they generalize information. They're also the way you organize your experiences. You all remember a few minutes ago, I had you reach out and touch a picture. How many did that? OK. How many noticed that when they changed the size of the picture, the feelings in their body changed? Raise your hands. If you didn't go back and do it again. This is a participatory workshop. If you don't do the drills, you don't get the skills. The secret to the, a lot of the change work that we do here is that you don't have to believe it'll work. But you do have to follow the instructions if you want the change. And you have to not actively resist what we're doing. Right? There's, there are smart guys out there and smart girls out there who out, are out to prove that they can't be changed. Well, with that attitude, you won't be. It's your pot of poop. You can stay in it if you want to. Right? But I want, you to, in a, I want to introduce you not to metaphysics, per se, although many of the things I'm about to explain to you can be thought of metaphysically. But let's think about it more from a neurological perspective. For those of you who don't know, I'm a licensed acupuncturist in the state of California. I also have a diplomat of oriental medicine. National, I'm nationally accredited. I am a Reiki master and teacher. I've been a Reiki master since the early 90s, before Reiki was even cool. I'm a certified pranic healer and pranic psychotherapist. I'm a master hypnotist and hypnosis trainer. I've published over 15 different products on aspects of the mind, energy healing, and getting clear. I'm a certified trainer through the Society of NLP under its founder, Dr. Richard Bandler. And I don't do windows. <laughs> so what I'm going to share with you is not BS. It's not mumbo jumbo. I forgot what? No. Fine. <laughs> I'm also an 8th degree black belt in uh, the martial arts, certified instructor in combat sistema, tactical knife defense, uh, cinco mano escrima, uh, small circle jiu-jitsu, combat arnis. Yes, have some. Right. <laughs> the reason that's actually relevant is because uh, sistema specifically is a martial art that's taught to the special forces. It's designed as a synthesis of mind-body techniques for learning to adapt and change in highly stressful combat situations. Most people don't know it, though, is that it has mystical origins. It actually has its roots in hesychasm, which is a form of Christian, mysticism, Christian monastic mysticism, kind of like the Shaolin, Christian Shaolin monks. Right? There's a lot of neuroscience, a lot of psychology, a lot of energy and breath work. There's a lot of things behind what I do. I'm happy to name my sources. I take credit for the synthesis, not the source. Okay, I had great teachers, and I, I honor and respect them all. But what we're going to talk about today isn't from one person or another. It's a new model based on what we've learned. Your nervous system is the world's most comprehensive and powerful information processing system, short of the universe itself, that exists. It has levels to it. 
but it's holographic in nature. What do I mean by that? Did you notice when John was standing up here that as he was describing his experience, he was gesturing in different places? That he was doing, he's making motions with his hands? Some of you didn't. Some of you were focused on his words, and that's normal. Some of you just focused on his face. How many people here have ever seen a movie like Iron Man? Mission Impossible. You know my favorite scenes? My scenes when they have that big virtual reality thing around them and he's opening these windows and he's moving stuff here and he's moving stuff there. Do you know where the inspiration for that came from? You. That's how your nervous system functions. It's a filing system, just like a desktop on your computer, just like a window on your iPhone. You can move windows around and it's really convenient, isn't it? That information and the structure that organizes your experience is right below the threshold of your conscious awareness. When I said imagine that you can reach out and touch a picture, the vast majority of you had no problem, even if you didn't see one. And then the minute you started playing, opening this, there's no picture there. Why should there be a change? Because there is a picture there. It's below the filters to your conscious awareness. And it's your ability to go into trance that gives you the power to change that desktop, to change that organization. You see, it's the size, the color, the location that determine how you process and filter your reality. It's all around you. And it comes out in the way you speak. It comes out in the places that you gesture to. It comes out in the direction your hands move when you describe an experience. How many people have ever had a pain that I took away? Raise your hands. A pain or, or something that I took? James, stand up for a second. Just, um, how many people have seen the, the, uh, the demo I did of Jamin where I give him an intense orgasmic experience? <laughs> Didn't see that one. It's like, not sure you want to, right? <laughs> describe, describe the experience for you. What was it like? Uh, well, you've done it multiple times. Um, yeah, I've given it multiples. So. <laughs> Uh, describe the experience of the pain being taken away? Yeah. So uh, one time when I came in with a toothache, um, I'd, gotten, I'd gotten back from the dentist or they're doing something, there was like nerve problems or challenges that I had with their... Oh, I remember that now, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, he just took it out. <laughs> See what he's doing? Altered it, changed, like, noticed the submodalities of it, the colors and stuff, and switched it around, and when we put it back, it was all good. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Give him a big round of applause. We're going to do that today. Or at least you're going to see me do it today. It, it all goes back to this concept I'm relating to you called the proprioceptive grid. Now, when I talk about those pictures and things, okay, it's a subjective projection. You have certain wiring in the brain, it projects around us spatially. How many people know what proprioception is? Raise your hands. If you don't, proprioception is a really long, drawn out, complex, scientific way of saying time and space. If I reach into my pocket and I feel something in my pocket, it's the aspect of my nervous system that knows what's in my pocket without me having to look at it. If I reach into my, ha my hand and there's a bunch of change, I can tell the dime from the quarter. I can tell the penny from the nickel without me having to look. If you were to have psychic abilities, if they did exist, if you were to have a sixth sense, it would be your proprioceptive nervous system. But it wouldn't be your sixth sense. It would be your sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth sense. Because there are at least six different types of nerve endings that feed information into your proprioceptive nervous system. And I hate to disappoint you, but you all have one. Okay? If you're a human being with a pulse, you have one. All right? But all of that information that comes in through your proprioception is filtered and processed pre-consciously. And it's an, a 360 degree awareness around you. When people in the, in the New Age movement, metaphysical community describe the aura, what do they describe? They describe a big bubble around us, don't they? Unfortunately, when we talk about energetics, we think of energy like this big nebulous cloud of information. But in the world according to David, Feel free to disagree. Are you saying it's like a band of energy around you? A lot of people say that, yeah. I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way at all. I think there's organization to it. How do I know this? Everybody think of something that happened four years ago. Something positive. We'll keep it positive for now. 
Reach out and touch it. Good. Go ahead. Do it. I mean, that means, that means do it, by the way. It's not, a, it's not a request. Now think of something that happened yesterday. Reach out and touch that. Oh, how about something that's going to happen a year from now? Notice they're in different places. Why? You have two sets of coding systems that your brain and your nervous system run on. You have a genetically passed on one and one that is unique to you. Let's play a game. I want you to, everybody on a, um, by the way, you'll hear me say this, use this term called bucket listing. Okay? When we talk about bucket listing, you see the problem that most people have when they try to fix their stuff is usually they're learning a brand new technique, which means they barely understand it out of the book. And then we instinctively, when we want to get rid of stuff, we pick the biggest, nastiest, most painful part of our life and throw this technique we barely understand at it and wonder why it doesn't always work. So I figured out, if, we were, if I were going to do this for myself, based on what I know about the unconscious mind. Remember, the unconscious mind, every time you have an experience, make sure I close this loop, every time you have an experience, information comes in from the outside, the first thing that happens is that information hits your critical factor. Your critical factor, or rational lying factor, the neocortex, is a filter. It lets in things and it put, keeps things out. Otherwise, we would change every time we got new information. You need that part of you. The problem is that sometimes the stuff that gets in, gets in around that, fa that filter, and it keeps us stuck instead of letting Sorry, us move forward. Are unconscious the same as the subconscious? No. Well, unconscious and subconscious in my world are, are actually a little bit different, but in the same realm. When I say subconscious, I'm talking about that grid that's right below the threshold of conscious awareness you just played with. When I talk about unconscious, I'm talking about the meat. I'm talking about the part that's running the heart, that's modulating your hormonal balance. They're both technically subconscious. Involuntary. Yeah. But in my world, I make a slight distinction. Okay? And depending on your level of trance, which is depth, absorption, and focus, you can access those systems. Otherwise, I couldn't do the work I do. Okay? Getting back to this, so one of the things we want to do, the minute we get information from our conscious mind, let's say, for instance, that I get a message from the outside world that David is, in fact, a flaming butthead. Right? So I get this message that David is a flaming butthead. And there's this little guy at the door. There's a guy at the front door, and there's a guy in the filing system. And the message comes in, David, you are a flaming butthead. The guy at the door goes, wait a minute, let me check. <laughs> hey, has David ever been a flaming butthead? I don't know, I'll look. Yes, David has been, in fact been a flaming butthead. <laughs> Go on in. And I get another file in my system. I get another charge to that, that belief. Let's say I get a message from the outside world. David, you're a flaming butthead. Let me check. Hey, has David ever been a flaming butthead? Nah, he's full of shit. Shit being a technical term. Go pound sand. That's the dynamic of your conscious and unconscious minds. The critical factor is designed to defend whatever's in there and to only accept things that match. Without, uh, unless you have a lot of emotion, you bypass the critical factor, or you have a lot of intense repetition, and even then, not so much. Okay? Yes? So how did the original stuff get in? Was done, most of it, the stuff that usually causes the problem, that is the, the, the hook that everything's connected to, happened before the age of five. More often than not. Okay? Whenever somebody comes in and they've got a, a chronic pain or they've got a fear, and even if it's something that just manifested last week, when you go in and you put them in trance and you ask the unconscious mind to go back to the first scene, situation, or event that has everything to do with that experience, you never go to that experience. 100% of the time I've, I've done this. It's always been 98% of the time, zero and five. And it's not always traumatic. It was just there first, and the unconscious mind found some kind of commonality that it used to connect things. It's only your conscious mind that has to have things in a linear path that understand things linearly. Your unconscious mind doesn't. If it, did, if it, if it just did things that way, we wouldn't be able to put two steps together. We'd fall over. Our heart would stop beating. 
Your unconscious mind is not a linear entity. Your higher mind is not a linear entity. The conscious mind, the analytical factor, evolved last. Does that make sense? This means yes, this means no. Okay, so that's the dynamic of conscious unconscious, or at least how, how we get information in. But the other part of that equation is that when that information is accepted, depending on the context and the emotional state we're in at the time, that file has certain characteristics to it, a size, a location, a shape. How many people here, when we started to do positive, when we started to tap into positive experiences, how many had their picture in color? Raise your hands if it was in color. Okay. How many was in black and white? Okay. If you don't know, go back and look. Right? And what I want you to do is if it's not in color, put it in color and notice what happens to your experience. If it's small, make it bigger. If it's two-dimensional, make it three-dimensional. If there's no sound, put sound in it. Notice what happens to the feelings in your body as you play with it. Welcome to the coding system your nervous system uses to create your experience of a memory or an event. Okay? If we can change that, we will change how your body processes the experience. Okay? Um, let's see here. Let's take a five minute break. You guys use the restroom, come on back, get some coffee, get some chocolate. <laughs>